tool to track flow. So um, I'll just start. So basically in our work, um, what we're trying to do is use the literature um, around uh, engagement and how students um, basically in, in interact with the learning material and the emotions they uh, receive from that experience. So um, that the research says that um, depending on the amount of skill a person has and um, the am amount of challenge they are uh, confronted with, they end up in a very simplified uh, state of emotions. Either they're frustrated, they're bored, or they feel like they're in flow and they feel like they can uh, move on with the experience. Uh, frustration is when the person has a challenge that is higher than their existing skill level. It is so high that no amount of assistance can get them to that new uh, level of achievement. Boredom is when somebody is uh, basically confronted with a task that is so simple and so basically not interesting to them that they um, the skill level is so higher than the challenge at hand that they become bored. Now in between it there's a fine line where a person feels that the challenge can uh, is, is, uh, can be achieved with maybe a little bit of assistance from a peer or maybe a tutor or maybe they have enough uh, ability in themselves to basically self-teach and accomplish that new skill. That's where uh, learning happens. Now, the objective of this uh, research was, can we track uh, this, uh, these, these uh, emotions in a person? And can we do that in an automated way using uh, sensor data? So sensor data, for example, um, let me just go to the next one, is, for example, uh, things, per peripherals that can attach to a computer that track certain things. For example, in our experiment, we had a uh, eye gaze sensor. Um, if you can see my mouse right there, we had a Microsoft Xbox Connect version two, and we had an EG amplifier sensor by Muse um, that was uh, placed on the person's head. So between these, we track the eye gaze, the body position in a sat position and the EG, the, uh, the waves coming from the forehead of the participant um, while they were performing a game. So the idea of, of that was we put this game in front of the person and um, they play the game. The game either has good or bad results. They either get the game um, challenge correct or incorrect. And the game is fun. However, it's very repetitive. It's a very long game. And uh, over time, they get fatigued, and they get tired, and they get uh, challenged because they're fighting against the uh, inhibition here to actually continue with the game. And while those uh, emotions of uh, basically physical capacity kick in, the person is less able to continue, we start seeing those signs of boredom and frustration if they're forced to continue with the game. Um, so what we tracked here um, alongside the sensory data, so we had the EG data, the eye gaze, the body position, and the tracking of the eye, eyes. We also tracked the inputs into the game using a button in front of the participant. From that, we got correct and incorrect responses to the game challenge. We got the reaction time, and we got how they pressed the button. So if they were like pressing the button multiple times, a single press, and um, how fast that was. And again, we got the multimodal, multi-sensor data. The game is a very simple one. So you only have to press the button when this cat um, is on the screen. And the cat is in between lots of dogs of similar color and a green uh, other cartoonic character here. So if the cat is on the screen, you press the button. And if the cat is not on the screen, you don't press the button. It's a very simple game. We had four participants from challenged and learning disabled backgrounds from a school, and they were around 16 to 19 years of age. Uh, the challenge slide, which is the, the one with the cat or not the cat on, is followed with, with a blank resting slide, 
and they did this uh, 48 times in every session. We had a total of 59 sessions. And um, in, the, in each session, they had 48 challenges, which amounted to about 2,900 samples in total. Um, here are some formulas for um, uh, what uh, each of these uh, basically sensors gave us. So when we collected the sensor data, it's basically amount of, amounted to a lot of digital uh, numbers. But to understand what those numbers actually mean, uh, what you do in machine learning is you create features. Um, we just uh, went with a common feature data sets that were in the literature. So things like from uh, the eye gaze we had um, scanning and dwelling. So scanning and dwelling would be like um, if your eyes are reading a sentence, you go from the first word to the second word and you keep going. That's a scanning behavior. Dwelling is more like, for example, if you're watching a TV show, we could see your eyes being quite uh, center of the screen of the TV. And that means that you're kind of dwelling in that area for a while. Eyes off, uh, eyes off screen are self-explanatory. EG alertness is a um, feature that we uh, use prior papers um, in, this, uh, in the literature to support a, uh, basically the power bandwidth of the alpha over beta. Um, and body, body fidgeting is just uh, the speed of the body moving in place, like uh, going back and forth. Uh, we had other very simple to understand features like max press count and a single fast press is when the person presses the button, but only presses the button once. And how quickly they do that is, um, was uh, interesting to us. We also created some high level features, which is a um, compound of the features above. It's a norm normalized um, average of uh, the features above. And um, we also looked at a few uh, signal detection theory uh, uh, features like discriminability, bias, hit rate, false alarm rate, commission, correct emissions, and wrong emissions. Uh, what these are uh, simply are um, they're, ba they're they're related to the signal detection theory, which this whole game is based on. Uh, the game it goes in the con uh, category of continuous performance tests, which are based on the theory of signal detection theory. Signal detection theory is a way to understand a person's performance in the game. So we looked at, at that as well. Um, I'm just, this slide is basically uh, giving you a, rev a, a overview of what the, how the game works before the child was set in front of the game. There was a little kind of animation that told them what they need to do. Then they went on to the game. They saw this screen. It was actually four by four, not three by three. But when they saw the cat in the center, they would press the button. I have a video of the uh, one of the students, uh, one of the uh, students actually playing the game. In while I play this, you might see that the actual ca cartoon characters are different. I had to change them. This is Wally for copyright reasons. Wally says hi. Hi. Let's play a game. Press the button if you see Wally. Don't press the button if Wally is not there. Press the button if you see Wally. Don't press the button if Wally is not there. Ready, set, let's find Wally. You can see the bubbles on the screen. That's where the child is actually looking at while they're playing the game. Oh, sorry. I wanted to go back and... Press the button. Wally is not. Let's find. Stop there. Um, so basically, there are four 
outcomes of this game. You either hit, get, get the, um, press the button when you see the cat. You either miss, the cat was there, you don't press the button. Um, the cat wasn't there and you don't press the button, that's a correct omission. False alarm is when you press the button and um, there's no cat there. That, uh, that results to a, uh, a uh, matrix of outcomes and the confusion matrix basically then leads to uh, the signal detection theory outcomes. Um, what we do with the data then is we take the CPT outcomes, so from the confusion matrix, we label the data on this uh, figure on the left hand side. The, the, sensor, the sensory data is coming in on the, um, in the blue, light blue on the left hand. You have the body pose, eye gaze, EEG data, and it's all synchronized in time. However, we use the, la uh, the outcomes from the game to actually label this data with, for example, a hit or a miss, a correct omission or a false alarm. That provides us a objectified um, outcome from the game to mark uh, the, the, sensory, the sensor data, which is actually the EEG, the eye gaze, and the body pose. What we want to do actually is create a machine learning model. Um, uh, here's some formulas for the signal detection theory. Um, I'll just go over these really quick. So after, after the machine learning um, uh, was uh, basically the, the platform was set up for machine learning, we ended up with uh, 2,570 different frames out of the, from the 59 sessions. We're looking to classify that in engaged and disengaged using the game outcomes. We, we use the seven uh, features that, um, the, from the, uh, from the uh, PowerPoint slide that had all the formulas and the two high-level compound features um, as uh, input data to the, machine learning out, uh, mach to the machine learning program. And um, basically, we wanted to determine the engagement outcome. We, f we compared a lot of machine learning uh, algorithms against each other. We found that uh, using random forest, we achieved 80% uh, of area underneath the curve um, with 93% uh, classification for flow or engagement and 42% accuracy for non-flow. Uh, we found that using the high level compound features that actually increased uh, the area underneath the curve and the true positives and true negatives, not by much, but there was some increase. 1.5 and 2.8 and 0.9 percent. We also found that if you use a subset of any of the sensors, so let's say the eye gaze falls out or the participant can't wear that EEG headband because they have some sort of disability that doesn't allow them to wear that on their head, or let's say they don't have use of their eyes or they can't move, let's see there's a subset of these sensors that you can use. We still show that you can get a certain amount of accuracy if you use a subset. So if you have three sensors, you could get between 73 and 78 percent, still using random forest. Um, if you have a s subset of two um, features, uh, you, you get 76 percent between uh, 69 and 76 percent if you include the interaction from the button. If you don't use the interaction from the button, you get between 61 and 70 percent. And uh, lastly, if you only have one sensor, you get between 48 and 63% of area underneath the curve. Um, now this uh, work has led to uh, more research studies, uh, European funded uh, research studies at Nottingham Trent University. One of them is using this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of uh, system in a classroom uh, to aid the teacher. So the teacher then has a dashboard and they can see using um, the devices that are set in front of the students, which student is struggling, which student is showing signs of frustration, which student is bored. And that will uh, help the teacher um, basically uh, use the time more wisely and attend to the students that are more in need of, uh, of their assistance. Um, uh, so the way we do that is in the new devices from Apple, they have a um, face tracking uh, uh, camera built into them. The iPad Pro, for example, the iPhone X and above all have face tracking built in and they also track the eyes. So using um, that, we've now created the app 
that first trains on the students, then it has a live mode that tracks the student um, behavior in real time. Uh, we were midway through the project when um, lockdown hit in, so we, that project is at a pause, but so far the app has been developed and the data has been collected to proceed to the next uh, stage. So that's uh, my study and uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Uh, I just wish uh, I'm open to questions now. Uh, are there any questions, please? Anybody? No. Okay, thank you. Yes, we'll go on to our next presentation.